Dude, we are going to energize the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the debated podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Lord Falks. Uh, who was a Member of Parliament for Carrick, Cumock and Doon Valley from 1979 to 2005, uh, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Lothians from 2007 to 2011, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for International Development from 1997 to 2001, and Minister of State for Scotland from 2001 to 2002. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Will. Nice to be with you. That sounded a bit too much like an obituary, but never mind. <laughs> It wasn't intended as such. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Uh, now, the first question I'd like to ask, yes. uh, of course, today has been uh, the uh, Labour Party conference, the online uh, conference, and Kiss Starmer only a couple of hours ago uh, gave his speech. If you've seen the speech, what did you think of it? And if you haven't yet seen it, what do you hope uh, he would have said in the speech? I've been following uh, some of the comments on the speech, although I didn't see it myself, and all of them have been positive. Of course, the ones you would expect to be from Labour MPs and Labour peers, <laughs> but also from the media. And the interesting thing is, he has uh, made absolutely clear that previous Labour governments have a record of which we can be proud. And I think one of the difficulties about the previous leader was that he tended to dismiss all the good things that previous Labour governments have done, uh, and including setting up the Scottish Parliament, uh, which I benefited from, but so many other things as well. And he also made it clear that there is a new leadership, there's a new dynamism in the Labour Party, and that there's a determination that we're going to win power at the next election. And I think with him we can do that now. He made it clear uh, exactly what our program is, what our plan is, not in detail, because it's too early to do that in the run-up uh, to an election in uh, just over a three and a half years' time, but uh, the general principles of it. So it is really encouraging to see uh, such a positive speech from what was a very difficult situation of a virtual conference. It's not like having two or 3,000 people getting up and giving you a standing ovation. But one of my colleagues said, if they had been in a, a, gym, in a hall hearing it, they would have, it would have got a 10-minute standing ovation. Do you think that, um, as you mentioned, uh, the differences between um, Keir Starmer and the previous leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, do you think that those differences are apparent to voters in uh, areas that the Labour Party lost out at the last general election in the north of England, or do you think it's going to take longer for those differences to be to be made clear? I think it will take time. I think uh, it, it, we've got to understand that you can't get things over, can't get messages over immediately. Uh, there is a time lag uh, and it does take time to explain them. But I think it's clear that first of all, he's not disowning previous Labour governments. He's building on the success of previous Labour governments, uh, particularly those of Tony Blair, but also of Gordon Brown. And uh, I think uh, over a period of time, as he gets around the country, once the pandemic is gone, people see him in person, he'll get the message over. And it is different uh, because, of course, we are going to be a radical government. We're going to do uh, many of the things that were in our manifesto at the last uh, election, but we're going to do it in a more pragmatic uh, way and bringing the people along with us. And he does talk about listening to the people. And I think that's one of the problems of the previous, uh, of Jeremy Corbyn, is that he wanted to convince the people that he was right and they were wrong. Uh, and said, look, you, you didn't vote for me. Uh, why didn't you vote for me? Uh, and uh, what Keir Starmer is saying, why didn't you, in a gentle way? Because we'll, we want to understand uh, exactly what the views of the voters are, particularly in the Red Wall, as it was, has been uh, called, but also in Scotland, where sadly we lost a lot of uh, seats uh, over the last uh, three general elections. 
Um, now you mentioned Scotland there, and of course one of the things that um, Keir Starmer talked about in the see, uh, in the speech was uh, bringing a sense of patriotism and, and pride in, in Britain uh, back to the Labour Party that many people had thought had uh, lacked in it. Now, obviously, there may be um, some people listening in Scotland who perhaps lean towards the SNP who would say, well, the patriotic thing we think is that, you know, Scotland should be uh, an independent country. What would you say to them uh, in, in regards to that? How do, you, how do you think it's best to frame the, patrio- uh, the patriotic argument for unionism? I think we've got to make it clear that we're not rubbishing the idea of nationalism. Uh, We're not saying that it's impossible uh, for Scotland to be an independent country. What we're saying is that it's better to be part of the United Kingdom. And if the SNP say, as they do, that we shouldn't have come out of the European Union, because that's been a successful union of 40 years, it's equally so that we shouldn't come out of the United Kingdom, which has been a successful union for 300 years. And the problems of Brexit that we're going to face would be 10 times, 100 times more in some cases if Scotland came out of the uh, United Kingdom. The pensions of people, uh, the uh, pr- problems of goods moving between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom, a whole range of things like that. The separate currency, they haven't, ar- they haven't answered the question as to whether they would keep the pound, and in which case they would be still subject to the Bank of England's uh, strictures, or whether they have, are going to have a separate currency, a new currency, or they're going to, as they move into the European Union, accept the euro. They just haven't thought these things out. So we, we need to spell out some of the dangers. It's not, independence is not impossible, but it, it, and, it, and it is a possibility, but it is not as good as being part of the United Kingdom. The other thing we need to do is to, to, to come up, and I've been arguing this for some time, with a new constitutional framework. We've given power, and I'm going to be asking a question about this shortly in the Chamber of the House of Lords, where we've given power to Scotland, to Wales, and it was already there in Northern Ireland. The democratic deficit now is the regions of England, and we need to uh, work out a a way in which we can get a federal or quasi-federal United Kingdom so that there's more power, more executive power, devolved to regions of England. That also provides us with a way of reforming the out-of-date uh, House of Lords, uh, which is, certainly needs reforming. And uh, I'm in favour of our policy, I've been arguing it very strongly, to set up a Senate of the nations and regions so that there would be um, senators indirectly elected from Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and the regions of England into the second chamber. It would be indirectly elected, so it wouldn't challenge the primacy of the House of Commons, but it would have some legitimacy, unlike this anachronism uh, that we have at the moment. But it would also help to um, keep the United Kingdom together. Now, you talked about um, devolving power to uh, the different um, regions in England. Do you think that that would be something that, because of course there was... um, uh, a vote in, I think it was 2002, 2003, uh, for a devolved region in the northeast, and that wasn't uh, successful. People didn't uh, support it. Do you think that there has been a change in people's attitudes now that there is more appetite for devolved regions? I think there is more appetite for uh, devolved regions if they have powers, real powers. The problem with the pr- proposal for the north of England, was, northeast of England, was that it didn't have real powers. When it went through the cabinet, the Labour cabinet, uh, to work out a blueprint, uh, all the secretaries of state uh, said, no, you can't have that. I want to keep that. No, you can't have that power. I want to keep that. And we ended up with a, a proposal which John Prescott put forward in all good faith, but it didn't have the real powers. What we need are regions with powers over planning, over transport, over a whole range of things, uh, economic development, and they, and if they have real powers, uh, we've already seen the beginnings of it in Greater Manchester, where Andy Burnham is doing an excellent job. Now, if we, if we worked out nine or ten regions for the whole of the United Kingdom and gave them real power and had elected uh, heads of each of these regions, then I think uh, people would accept that. Uh, now, one of the things uh, that we have discussed and mentioned is Brexit. And of course, the Internal Market Bill 
going through the House of Commons at the moment will be uh, coming to the House of Lords soon. Uh, what are your initial uh, thoughts on the internal market, Bill? It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace to democracy. I'm a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, where we challenge uh, countries like uh, uh, Russia and uh, Turkey about uh, the, their democracy. And it will be difficult for us to challenge them with this in, if this internal market bill goes through in its present form, because it will allow the British government to renege on treaties, not just this one treaty of uh, uh, the uh, Brexit, but on a whole range of other treaties. And that is really quite, quite outrageous. So we hope and expect to make major changes. If, it, if they don't come in the House of Commons, we'll make them in the House of Lords. Uh, we won't vote, I don't think we'll vote against the second reading, but we'll, we'll, we will make some clear uh, and, and strategic amendments with the support of the Liberal Democrats and of the crossbenchers, and we'll challenge the House of Commons uh, it could be one of the most interesting uh, debates and issues over the next few months. Um, now, of course, if the bill uh, is passed, which obviously uh, you'd hope that it is current form, it isn't, it will certainly cause a great deal of tension, not just between um, Britain and uh, the European Union, but Britain and the United States. If we come to a situation where we are going to leave without a deal and rely on, on free trade agreements. And the European Union and the United States have said, oh, well, we won't agree to a, a free trade uh, agreement because you have endangered the Good Friday, uh, called the Good Friday Agreement. What sort of position do you think that leaves Britain in? It leaves us in an impossible position. And, and, and uh, they, they, that's what we're going to argue to we're try and tell the government. And people in the government themselves, including uh, Theresa May, the former prime minister, are saying this is just disgraceful. And if the, uh, I, I suspect there's a chance that this is the kind of thing that could bring Boris Johnston down. Uh, and that would be, have a great advantage, uh, double advantage. There. <laughs> uh, so uh, we really do. It is a, a major issue for the United Kingdom and lawyers have been saying this, but not just constitutional experts, but so many other people have been saying this, that for our, our integrity, for our honor, uh, for, for the whole uh, ethos of the democracy of the United Kingdom, we need to check, get this bill changed. Um, and of course, mentioning the United States there, uh, it's not that long till the uh, US presidential election yeah. uh, happens. If uh, there is a, if, if Trump is re-elected or if Biden is re-elected, what impact do you think that that's going to have on potential trade deals? Do you think that uh, President Biden might be more uh, favourable towards the United Kingdom, or, or what are your thoughts? He'd be more predictable. That's one thing, sir. <laughs> he he would he would react in a more intelligent way. Uh, he would, of course, still have the interests of the United States prime in, in the forefront of his mind. And that would be his primary interest. But he would also know uh, how to deal with the United Kingdom. Where, and, and, and wouldn't do us down. Uh, where we are going to be in difficulty is that for the, for the United States, as for other major uh, trading partners, the European Union is still much more important and will remain more important than the United Kingdom. And that's one of the things we're going to find difficult. Uh, we think we're still a great uh, imperial nation. I think we're going to realize that although we're still an important power and we're, uh, as Keir Starmer said, we are as much patriotic about Britain as anyone else, we have to be realistic and, and uh, put it into perspective and we were no, we're no longer an imperial power, and we have to work closely, particularly with our European neighbours. Um, now, looking forward to the future, next year we're going to be seeing a, a raft of elections. We'll be seeing um, council elections and uh, elections in, in, in Scotland and Wales. What do you think is going to be the most uh, central issue to, to Labour's campaign in those elections? Do you think it's going to be the result of Brexit or do you think it's going to be coronavirus or do you think it's going to be something else? I think it'll be, uh, there'll be a whole range of things, but I think the one thing that is above all 
uh, concerning the Labour Party is the division of wealth within this country and within the world. Uh, those are two related, separate but related issues. The, the number of millionaires and billionaires that have made millions and billions more during this coronavirus epi epidemic is just disgraceful. And the number of poor people who have become poorer is disgraceful. That's within the United Kingdom as well as around the world. And we need to do something about that. We need to be to, leveling up needs to be our major uh, uh, agenda item. And we need to do that. There are so many people whose lives are made a misery because they are, uh, their income is so low uh, and their wealth is non-existent. And there are, on the other hand, there are a handful, a number, a growing number, sadly, of people who are just million, millionaires and billionaires who spend extravagantly and, and are greedy and what more. And we need to do something about that. That should be our prime uh, issue. Um, now, of course, as I mentioned, there'll be regional elections in, in, in Scotland, Scottish parliamentary elections. Uh, what do you think that the Labour Party needs to do in Scotland to win over voters to say, you can trust us and you should elect us uh, to govern in Holyrood? I think, first of all, we don't need to, uh, we need to have an answer to the constitutional question. Uh, and I think that is federalism. And I think we should give that answer and then uh, move on, and move on to the services in Scotland have been uh, forgotten about. They have been abandoned in many cases by the SNP. They pretend to be a centre-left party, but they're not. They pretend to be an efficient uh, administration, but they're not. We have ferries on the Clyde that are, should have been completed two years ago and should be ferrying now between... Uh, the mainland and islands that are not being completed. We have a children's hospital in Edinburgh, which was completed two years ago, but which has not yet been opened through incompetence of the government. We have courts that have been closed around the country uh, and a great waiting list of uh, uh, people needing to be uh, given a, a trial. Uh, we have a whole range of areas where the government, the SNP government, have not uh, done what they proposed, land reform. Uh, we still have these huge estates with major landowners uh, in, the, in Scotland, and the SNP promised land reform, and nothing has happened. There's a whole range of radical reform that is needed, uh, and we should, be, uh, we, we should be putting that, and we will be putting that forward in the uh, Scottish election. But we need first to answer the constitutional question and then move on to these major issues. Do you think part of the issue has also been the leadership of Scottish Labour? Because I know that there has been um, criticism brought, not just by yourself, but uh, by others to the leadership of Richard Leonard. Do you think that it's time for a change in leadership in Scottish Labour? I did argue that Richard Leonard should consider his position and he, he declined my invitation <laughs> uh, to, to do that. Uh, and to be fair, in the last few weeks, he has raised his game uh, because of the criticism, because some people have pointed out that he hasn't been making an impact. He has made an effort. Uh, he's uh, getting out and about more. He's uh, raising issues in the uh, parliament more. They put down a, a vote of no confidence on uh, the SNP in relation, and John Swinney in relation to the exams failure. So they've been, they've been raising, he, he has been raising his game. And uh, if over the next uh, week, few weeks, uh, the opinion polls show uh, that he is making an impact, then obviously it will be in a different situation. And I certainly hope that happens, because I certainly don't want us to lose seats. We've got some very good MSPs, very good candidates standing for Scottish Labour, and they deserve to be elected. And so I hope that uh, the fact that Richard Leonard is raising his game will get over to the Scottish people, that he will make an impact, he will take on board, he said he's going to, that he will take on board the criticisms, and we'll see a, a, an upsurge. Do you think that um, part of the issue uh, with um, Labour in, in Scotland in the past uh, 
five years since the uh, loss of a, a great deal of um, labour and peace to the SNP in the, the 2015 uh, election. Do you think that part of that is because some voters in Scotland feel that the Labour Party isn't as connected to Scotland and Scottish issues as it has been in the past? I, I think there is a bit of that, but I think it's mainly because people have been voting because on the basis of identity rather than political issues. And we need to get them back onto the political issues. And uh, identity, I'm a Scot uh, and I'm a Brit and a European. You know, I, I don't think that the one or two or three things are mutually exclusive. But more and more people have been voting for the, on the basis of identity. And of course, it doesn't help uh, that we've got an incompetent government here in Westminster. Uh, and that does make a lot of Scots think, crikey, anyone can do better than Boris Johnston uh, and uh, Nicola Sturgeon for all her failings. And uh, as I've said, the government, the Scottish government have so many failings in health and education and justice and transport, for all their failings, they're still better than uh, Boris Johnson's government. But what, what we need to get over is that we don't need to have either of them. We can have a Labour government at Westminster under Keir Starmer and his dynamic new leadership, and we can uh, have that working with a Labour government or, given the voting system, more likely a coalition government uh, in Hollywood. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the podcast. It's been uh, fantastic to speak to you. And I have one uh, final question. Yes, well. Given that you have been a member of several different uh, assemblies, member of the House of Commons, member of uh, Holyrood, uh, member of the House of Lords, uh, my final question to you is this. If you could change one piece of legislation l- right now, any piece of legislation uh, throughout your, your, your time in politics and just click your fingers and it's just gone. Uh, what piece of legislation would you choose? That's probably the most difficult question. Uh, I, th- I was hoping <laughs> you were going to ask me which of the many uh, parliaments, the three parliaments and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, I, I think is m- more interesting and more powerful. And I <laughs> definitely think the House of Commons mm. is by far the most interesting. And even with the present difficulties, it would, uh, it would um, remain so... Uh, it remains so. Mm. Uh, one piece of legislation is very difficult uh, to, to think, because, mm. uh, absolutely, because uh, I, I put forward early on uh, banning smoking in public places. We've got that now. Yeah. Uh, I put forward a, a, a age discrimination bill, and we've got that now. Mm. So a lot of that. I think pro- possibly reform of the House of Lords. If I could manage before I leave the House of Lords to help towards making it uh, a, a better second chamber without the anachronism of the uh, hereditary peers and with some democratic accountability, be able still to work with the House of Commons. I think we'd have achieved uh, something. Uh, I don't think we can change the world or even the country as a whole with a piece of legislation, but that would be a wee step forward. Well, I think that's a very uh, noble ambition and one that I hope you will be able uh, to achieve. Thank you once again for coming Thank on. Thank you very much, Will. Nice to talk to you. Great to speak to you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam, and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast, or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.